All right, there may still be some people filing in, but in the interest of everybody's time, we're going to go ahead and get going. Uh, thanks for coming to the return of the DuPage Ross presentation series. We took last month off, um, kind of like a mini summer vacation. So we're glad that people could make it to this one. Um, if you've never attended one of these, it's a chance for us to take a little bit more time and dig into a topic that's related to recovery. Um, we have great presentations at the Ross Council meetings, but those meetings are obviously, uh, the time doesn't always allow to kind of dig deeper on certain topics. So um, we use this as that opportunity to do that. Um, before we get started, I do wanna share a few things that are coming up. So if you'll allow me to share my screen, I can uh, talk to you all about those. All right. So the next uh, DuPage Ross Council meeting will be on Wednesday, September 13th at 3 p.m. Um, I always miss, mispronounce his name. I'm going to try try to do a better job here. Uh, Greg Sikowski uh, from the DEA, he does division training up here in Northern Illinois. Uh, he does a great presentation on fentanyl and counterfeit pills. Um, he'll be there. Uh, I think he's actually going to be there in person for us to do that presentation. So we're excited for that. Uh, so that's Wednesday, September 13th at 3. Tomorrow, the third Thursday of every month at 3.30 p.m. Uh, that's a lot to say at one time. Uh, we have the DuPage RCO virtual Narcan training. Um, so this is on Zoom. Um, it's a good kind of primer for people who maybe don't have any exposure to opioid overdose um, uh, reversal or Narcan or any of that type of stuff. But we also do talk a little bit about um, some of the trends that we see and um, so even people who know about Narcan might be able to pick up something from those. Uh, so feel free to share this. If you've got uh, clients or friends or family uh, that might benefit from this, uh, feel free to share this with them. This is also on our Facebook group uh, and on our webpage. Um, and then also if people take this training and they are interested in uh, receiving some Narcan, they can talk to us um, at the meeting. We'll make sure that we get that to them. Before the meeting started, I did mention uh, the annual DuPage Rask Picnic coming up this Saturday, August 19th, uh, 11 a.m. to 3 p.m. right over here in beautiful Churchill Woods Forest Preserve in Lombard. Uh, Rask is providing most of the food. Um, when I say most, I mean like the main stuff. So we're going to have burgers, hot dogs, uh, drinks, uh, and then we'll probably have some dessert stuff too that we uh, provide. Uh, but if you want to come and bring something to share, feel free. Uh, we'd love for you to do that. Uh, we got a ton of games that we're bringing. Um, last year, I think we had 50 some odd people show up and it was the very first one. So we hope to have another good turnout. Um, and as uh, we said before the meeting, Ben is the guest of honor. So we'll have him say a few words at the picnic. Uh, we'll put him on the spot. Um, also, this one's pretty exciting. Uh, our annual pancake breakfast is coming up. So this is Saturday, September 30th. Um, this is with Serenity House Alumni Network and DuPage Rosk. Um, we do this, uh, used to be about twice a year. Currently we're doing it about once a year, um, but this is so much fun. Uh, the clients here at Serenity House help do the cooking. It's $5 for all you can eat. Uh, breakfast starts at eight. We also do some uh, really, really cool giveaways. We always have some really great gift baskets uh, and 50-50 raffles. Um, so we sell those tickets like a buck a piece. Um, come on out, win some cool stuff. Um, we also usually have a short speaker and then a Narcan presentation at 10 a.m. So if you can make it to that, we would love it. Everybody knows Overdose Awareness Month. Uh, there's a ton of events coming up. Here's ours. So Wednesday, August 30th, uh, with the Glendale Heights PD, we are doing a celebration of life through art and music. Um, we did this with them last year, kind of changed in the format a little bit this year and really trying to focus on um, some of the uh, artistic things that we can do to celebrate people who we've lost through overdose. Uh, but this is from 6 to 9 p.m. at Veterans Memorial Park in Glendale Heights. Uh, there's there's an off chance, I'm still trying to figure out the timing, that we can uh, unveil the uh, Narcan vending machine that we've uh, provided for Glendale Heights at this event. Uh, if not, we'll definitely um, be talking about it at that event. So it's on its way, and we're pretty uh, excited about that. The other international overdose awareness day event is the 31st. Uh, that is here at Serenity House. Um, we're going to have a lot of fun. There's uh, going to be resource tables, uh, some speakers. Um, 
Lisa is a gal who plays the the chimes and singing bowls, uh, and she's amazing. I, I, I always say like she's one of my favorite parts of doing some of these events because she's so great at it. Um, we're also going to do uh, artistic stuff there too. Um, and in addition, we've got some food. Eternal Buzz Cafe has uh, been a friend to Ross since the very beginning. Um, Vito and Rachel, who run that, um, make their own scones. They make their own gelato. Uh, it's phenomenal. So they're going to be there. Clyde's Donuts, who's down the street, is going to provide us some donuts. And uh, the Center Cup is an amazing coffee truck uh, from the Center Church. And they'll be there um, providing coffee. So everything's free. Everything's complimentary. Uh, come out and see us. That is on the 31st. And then the last thing before we kick on to the uh, presentation part, um, I didn't get a chance to do this at the meeting because we hadn't, hadn't had them uh, available yet. But I just wanted to show some of the um, Narcan vending and box stuff that we've got. So this was through a partnership with the DuPage Health Department. So there's a couple of different kinds of boxes we have. So this is the first one. This is what I call a, uh, a gravity vending machine, which means you can pull it out of here and then the next one drops down. So this is a wall box um, with our branding and a QR that can take people back to our website. Um, so there's a couple of these boxes. Uh, one is going to the West Suburban Fellowship Club in Naperville, which is the, uh, the kind of the largest 12-step club in the DuPage area. Um, they have meetings seven days a week uh, from 5 a.m. till 10 p.m. So people are coming in and out of there. It's a great place for people to be able to access Narcan. Uh, the other box is going to an organization called 360 Youth Services, which provides um, housing and services for at-risk youth, uh, but especially those uh, who identify as LGBTQIA+. Um, so traditionally, it's kind of been an underserved community. Um, it's not an abstinence-based program, and so I think it's it's a good partnership to have um, in case anybody needs those harm reduction materials out there. And then we also have another cabinet, which is a little bit more simplistic, uh, just a, a swinging door with a glass front. Um, we are looking for a third partner. So if you or anyone you know in DuPage might make a good fit, uh, we are having some conversations about that. Um, I'd be happy to talk more about it. The sites really don't have to do anything. Um, DuPage Rosk is handling everything. So from installation and uh, maintenance to refilling. Um, and then we can also drive people back to us uh, for help with other recovery resources. So um, if anyone's interested in that, please let me know and we'll have a conversation about that. All right, I'm gonna stop share here. Okay, so our presenter today uh, is Danny Sorbus. And uh, Danny has been working in the same office as me since last year, almost about a year, he came in in September. And uh, Danny is the regional mentor liaison um, for the region two Ross. So I can let him explain a little bit more about that, what that is when he starts, uh, but he's also a CSAC candidate. So um, sex addiction is something that, you know, he, uh, treatment is passionate about. And um, I think it's a really important topic because it's something that doesn't get talked about a lot. I think there's plenty of, um, plenty of information out there about substance use disorder, mental health, but sex addiction is one of those things that uh, sometimes people can be suffering from and not really know it. Um, and there's a lot of overlap too. There's a lot of overlap with people who are dealing with substance use as well. Um, and there can be some cross addiction stuff. Uh, but I'm going to let him talk. I'm going to give him the floor. And then at the end, uh, if anybody has any questions or comments, we'll leave some time for uh, some conversation at the end. So Danny, I'm going to give it to you. All right. Can you guys see my screen? Yep. Awesome. All right. So hello, everybody, and good morning. Uh, as Jared said, my name is Danny Sorvis. Most of you guys know me from coming to our uh, Ross Council meetings. Uh, my title for Ross is Regional Committee Mentor Liaison. So like Jared said, I provide mentorship to the region two consuls. There's five regions of Ross consuls throughout the state of Illinois and we're region two. So I help mentor them. Um, sorry, I got this thing in the bottom of my screen. I'm trying to move. All right. All right. Um, I'm also a recovery coach with the Serenity House and outside of Serenity House in DuPage Ross, I'm a licensed clinical professional counselor and a CSAT candidate, Certified Sex Addiction Therapist candidate. I'm very passionate about this. Um, when Jared asked me to do this presentation, I was more than willing to do so. 
Um, so I just wanted to give you guys kind of an introduction on what sex addiction is and uh, ways you can recover, support, uh, support groups and resources that people could use. Um, if there's any questions, if we have time at the end, please feel free to ask. And if we don't have time to ask your questions or if you want more in-depth questions or have more in-depth questions, feel free to contact me afterwards. Jared, I don't know if you can put in my email in the chat so people can reach out to me if they need to. All right. I want to start off with this quote. Addiction isn't about substances. You aren't addicted to the substance. You are addicted to the alteration of mood that the substance brings by anonymous. So I wanted to share that because um, people are like, well, Danny, substances, that's the whole point of addiction, right? That's what most people know. Um, you become addicted to the substance. No, well, you become chemically dependent on the substance, alcohol, opiates, so on and so forth. But it's really the alteration of mood that the substance brings, right? It's, I want to feel extra good, or I want to escape a particular feeling that's got me down. Um, or if it's somebody who is extremely chemically dependent and they're avoiding withdrawal, well, again, they're changing their mood from feeling a terrible, terribly physically to in a uh, better or normal state of mind otherwise. Substance addiction versus process addiction. Um, so both activate the brain's reward pathway and release dopamine. It feels good. Of course you want to do it in the beginning, right? The substance, you know, like I went to a presentation before on dopamine. They said that alcohol, if, if first, if you're normal, uh, dopamine level is a 50 and on your best day, it's a hundred alcohol makes it, you know, is, is a 600. Um, sex is also about that range. I believe meth was 1100, just for points of reference. So yeah, if you do something, you want to feel good. So they activate the reward, the reward pathway. Over time, change the brain, which occur in both addictions, set the stage for intense cravings and increased tolerance. So because, again, you're feeling extra good when you use a substance, eventually you build a tolerance. So as time goes on, any addiction is a progressive disease. So the more you do something, the the more uh, the longer you do something and build that tolerance, you either have to increase the substance you're using or increase the riskiness of the acting out behaviors that you may be doing. And eventually as they progress, you experience serious and negative life consequences, whether it's uh, professional, relationships, social, physical, things of that nature. The difference comes down to this. With the process addiction, the individual repeats an activity or behavior to get the desired effect. So it's the activity or behavior. Versus a substance, it's about the drugs or alcohol as the vehicle of choice. Unfortunately, an individual can be addicted to the process or behavior just as they can with the substance. That's why I, I like the quote that I shared on the slide beforehand to point out that it's the alteration of mood rather than just the substance. Um, process addictions are much harder to spot because they involve behaviors that are often socially acceptable. For example, gambling, internet, um, eating, shopping, and sex. So, you know, going to the casino isn't necessarily a bad thing, but if you have a compulsion to go to the casino and spend all your money, <laughs> that's a problem. Exercising, that's healthy, right? How is exercise a potential process addiction? You know, people are supposed to exercise to get in shape, again, if it's leading to consequences and if you're doing it despite other obligations you have, that's a problem. Sex, sex is supposed to be healthy, right? Don't all healthy relationships involve sex? Well, yes, but again, what are, you know, what else is in, included in that? So we'll talk more about the sex aspect right now. So I often ask this question and I wanna ask you guys to put your answers in the chat, but if we were doing this kind of live presentation, I would ask for volunteers, but what do you think of when you hear sex addict or that someone has a sex addiction? And often the, the replies that I get from the audience is, oh, somebody's obsessed with porn or child molester, rapist, um, fantasizing. So, you know, some of the things that I just mentioned are sexually offensive behavior. So I want to make a distinction between a sex addict and a sex offender. Um, a sex offender is doing something that's causing harm to somebody else, right? That's where you hit the rapist, child pornography, child molester, things like that. 
sex addict is somebody who just has an obsession with sex or a compulsion to have sex or pornography or to commit certain acts that aren't necessarily illegal. Um, a sex addict can be a sex offender and a sex offender can be a sex addict, but they don't have to, but you don't have to be both. You could be one or the other um, or have uh, aspects of both. What is sex addiction? So sex addiction is an intense focus on sexual fantasies, urges, or activities that can't be controlled and causes distress or harm to your health, relationships, career, or other aspects of your life. Again, the word compulsion, excuse me, I want to stress. So fantasies itself isn't a bad thing, but are they causing distress to you? Are they compulsive? Do you try to avoid those fantasies? Do you try to avoid acting out, you know, flirting, watching pornography, having affairs. Um, if you are continuing to act out sexually in those types of ways, despite trying to stop or despite the consequences, that's what makes it a sex addiction. Other terms associated with sex addiction are compulsive sexual behavior, problematic sexual behavior, hypersexuality, hypersexuality disorder, sexual compulsivity, and sexual impulsivity. Um, so like hypersexuality, again, in, in and of itself doesn't necessarily mean you're a sex addict. It could just be that you're hypersexual. Somebody may engage in sexual problematic behavior, but they may or may not be a sex addict. The compulsive aspect is what makes an addiction. Although sex addiction involves activities that are common to sex life, such as masturbation, pornography, phone sex, cyber sex, multiple partners, and more, again, it's when it consumes your life that you make it be considered to have a sex addiction. Craving for sex is similar to that of alcohol and drugs. Um, it's an overwhelming compulsion temptation that's so strong you have to have it. It's an out of control feeling, never satisfied. It's a constant battle to take control of something that's on autopilot. You may return to the behavior over and over again despite the consequences. So that autopilot, right? I want to talk about that for a minute. Um, I work with many clients who describe the autopilot feeling to me. And one person in particular um, it was a male addict. I've worked primarily with the male addicts and the couples, you know, and, and as a whole. But the male addict came to me and said, you know, I, I don't know what to do, Danny. He's like, I, ha I, I have this urge to continue to act out. It's something that I cannot control. I get off on the planning of it. And then when I actually go have sex with another woman, I feel you know, great in the moment. And afterwards, I'm sobbing, crying, because I can't believe what I just did. I feel so much shame, so much guilt, you know, I can lose my marriage, what is wrong with me. And then I'll get a notification on my phone. And the next thing I know is, oh, my God, I'm right back into that autopilot mode where I forgot that I was just crying and upset. I'm back to planning my next acting out session. So that's an example of how an autopilot could look. Who does it affect? Sex addiction impacts 3 to 10% of the U.S. population. 10% is a lot. And even still, I think it's underreported. Um, you know, Jared mentioned before that there's a lot of stigma around sex addiction. You know, um, luckily with the ROSC, Serenity House, other programs, um, are working toward reducing substance abuse stigma, which has been great and I'm very thankful for. However, sex addiction is very highly stigmatized. Again, like I asked, what do people think of when they hear sex addict? Then it's rapist, child molester, so on and so forth. So, you know, they're focusing more on the um, offensive behaviors versus the addiction that needs to be treated. It's more common in men than women. For every two to five males with a sex addiction, one woman is affected. I also believe that's underreported. Um, again, a woman is stigmatized. We know that if a man uh, sleeps with woman, um, this is a stereotype, obviously, that he is seen as the man versus if a woman is sleeping with multiple people, they're seen as a slut. Um, so it's, again, stigmatized and very sexist and that kind of thought. Sex, sexual addiction begins on average at the age of 18, but most individuals don't reach out for professional help until the age of 37. So I could just based on the average, that's 19 years, you know, more than the person has lived before they finally get help. 
Now, there are, of course, there are sex addicts who start off even younger than that, and there's some sex addicts that are older, but 18 years of age is the median. Many individuals, approximately 88%, have a history of other mental health conditions as well, such as anxiety, depression, PTSD, etc. So it is a co-occurring disorder. There is debate that is ongoing if sex addiction can be classified as a mental health disorder. The American Psychiatric Association, or APA, rejected a proposal to include hypersexuality disorder as a condition in the DSM-5, stating there's a lack of evidence and that there were potential consequences of calling excessive sexual activity a pathology or calling it a disease or disorder. Um, again, as I've been working with sex addicts for quite a while now, and I, I you know, my strong opinion is it is definitely an addiction, is definitely a disorder, and uh, I wish that we, we, I hope that we will make progress by the time the next edition of DSM-5 comes out or the DSM-6. Um, if we have time later, again, if people want more information, I have the criteria of what the proposal was for the hypersexual disorder, but I'm not going to share it necessarily right now. Some of the things that they did find that were hard to measure was the level of impairment, diminished control consequences, level of risk-taking, and exactly how to measure cravings and urges. How does a sex addict feel? So a sex addict may feel guilt. They feel bad for what they've done or mistakes that they've made. Shame, they feel they're an immoral person. So now the difference really quick between shame and guilt, if I feel that I'm, Im I'm an immoral person or the person feels that they are an immoral person, that shame, they nothing they will do afterwards will be moral because they are themselves immoral. However, if they flip that to guilt, which I often get my clients to try to do and say, hey, I did an immoral act or I made mistakes, well, you can change that. You know, I often tell clients, and it's the truth, they're good people. They have an addiction and they don't know how to process things around them. So they've acted out instead. They've instead engaged in the sexual sexual addiction and the behaviors associated with it. So I try to shift the focus from shame to guilt to help see that they can make better choices remorse, feel terrible for what they've done, overwhelmed. You know, they have so many emotions going on, they don't even know how to handle it or process it. Hopeless, nothing will change. Powerless, nothing they will do can change their addictive behavior. Depressed, lonely, fearful, anxious, and at times suicidal. I've worked with clients who have never had a history, you know, even though I mentioned earlier co-occurring disorders, but I've had clients who don't have a history of being suicidal. Um, however, when they are coming forward with a disclosure or they are discovered or even through the recovery process, you know, they, it's so overwhelming to them that they don't want to be able to deal with any of the above feelings. I mean, you know, that I had mentioned, we just discussed and they think the only way out is to commit suicide. So it's something that uh, I make sure to screen for every session that I do. Now I mentioned a couple words there, discovery, um, discoveries when they are caught by their spouse, by their boss, by whoever, while they're sexually acting out. Disclosure may or may not be uh, around discovery. So sometimes people disclose once they're discovered. Sometimes people disclose by sharing all, you know, what's happened to them or what they've done um, informally afterwards, you know, just telling their spouse all their acting out behaviors or at least some of them. Uh, CSATs do a formal disclosure process um, in which they have uh, their clients write out letters um, about everything that they've done, and they have meetings with their spouse, um, the addict, and then hopefully the spouse also has a therapist as well to come together and do a more formal disclosure. Um, yeah. Some signs and symptoms of sex addiction. You're obsessed with sex. You spend a lot of time fantasizing about your sexual, excuse me, your sexual urges and engaging in sexual behavior. So this is fantasizing about who you'd want to act out with, when you would be able to act out. Maybe it's somebody that's unattainable. Um, you masturbate often, once or several times a day, even if it causes physical injury. Um, I've worked with clients who have lesions to their um their penis or possibly their vagina due to excessive masturbation. You may frequently view pornography. 
Sources include videos, adult magazines, and the inter internet, websites, and webcams, and people will often masturbate while viewing pornography. You often spend an excessive amount of time planning for your sexual activity, uh, a lot of time figuring out where and how you will get your next sexual high. And kind of with the example I was mentioning earlier um, about that individual who would be home crying and then get the, uh, you know, the text and go right back into autopilot. Uh, for him and for many that I've worked with, it's getting off, you know, the dopamine hit is highest in terms of their planning. Well, my spouse is going to be away spending the night, uh, you know, at her parents this weekend. So she'll be gone from 7 p.m. Friday night till, you know, 1 p.m. on Saturday. And it goes even further than that. They'll plan, okay, well, if they, if, even though she leaves at seven, I have to make sure she's not coming home right away. And we have an alarm at our house. So um, when I let the dog out for his last night potties, I got to think, all right, that's around 930. So my partner, a fair partner needs to come home right at that time. So that way my wife doesn't suspect or see the alarms on the doors go off differently. And all of this is a high net of itself. So yeah, the planning, the planning is important for a lot of the addicts. You frequently use sexual services. This is considered a step up in that your activities now involve human interaction. Behaviors could include phone sex, connections made through internet chat rooms, paying for sexual encounters, massage parlors, visits to strip clubs, or having multiple partners or frequent one night stands. You know, when I was uh, putting this in the in the presentation, you know, and I saw, you know, the source that I used called it a step up. It is and it isn't. And I say that for, for this reason, right? Um, we call sex addiction a, a relational disease because of the persons in a committed relationship or marriage or what have you. Um, it's not only about the act, but it's about their partner. And it's also important to remember their partner's recovery, which I'll get into in a little bit. But you know, it's not only what the addict sees, the partner is important. So some people may say, well, pornography, that's not a big deal. Pornography doesn't include another actual person. So why would uh, somebody be upset about watching pornography? And, you know, the cliche that most men view pornography anyways. Um, other people might say, well, I don't, you know, pornography, why are they watching that? That's making the partner feel bad because the actresses in the pornography videos, you know, are very attractive or skinny or doing things that the spouse or partner would never do. Um, and those people feel deeply hurt that their addict partner is watching something that is uh, making them feel undesirable because it's something they cannot match. I've worked with other people who um, their partner doesn't care if they have one night stands, you know, but they do care if they're having long term affairs. So, again, it's different for every partner. That's the point I'm trying to illustrate. And it's important to get both the partner and the addicts. Um, perspective on this. Your behavior escalates to reckless sexual activity. You may add substance abuse, again, cross-addiction type behaviors to your sexual activity, sexual aggression, so maybe it's role play. Um, right now, one of the big things is called CNC, that's consensual non-consent, and it often involves um, some extreme role plays, including rape, um, that people try to bring into the bedroom. Uh, dangerous sexual activity, such as autoerotic asphyxiation to your behaviors, that's choking. Um, I was surprised. I'm, I can't remember the percentage. I apologize for that. But uh, I was surprised the percentage of people who've actually passed away unintentionally due to autoerotic asphyxiation. You engage in sexual behaviors that go against your personal values, religious beliefs, or what society deems appropriate. So this can involve... Uh, people you may not normally sleep with. I work with heterosexual men who will sleep or who will have homosexual encounters, um, you know, in the midst of their sex addiction. And the opposite. I've worked with homosexual men who have heterosexual encounters just because it's a different type of high. It's a different type of risky behavior they want to engage in. Frequently engage in paraphilia. So these are sexual behaviors that may involve another person's psychological distress, injury, or unawareness. Examples include exhibitionism, so exposing generals to strangers, the typical trench coats and opening the trench coat. Voyeurism, watching others engage in sexual activities without them knowing, so maybe you're staring in binoculars through somebody's window. 
sadomasochism, sexual pleasure from inflicting pain or humiliation on others or oneself. The sadist part, you know, the way that I was told to remember this, sadist, you make other people sad. <laughs> Whereas masochist, the M for me, when you make, uh, inflict pain on yourself or humiliation yourself. And pedophilia, which is an offensive behavior and that's sexual feelings toward children. Uh, you can't stop your sexual behavior despite negative consequence to finances, relationships, health, or emotions, which we have talked about. This is kind of a quick symptom checklist that uh, we give to those who may have a sex addiction that uh, have not accepted it yet or are just trying to figure out if they do or not. Does your sexual behavior cause you distress or interfere with important areas of functioning? So do you lose sleep due to sexual thoughts or actions? Um so that could be fantasizing, as we talked about earlier. That could be, um, all right, well, my wife doesn't like when I watch porn, so I will do it when she's sleeping. You know, arriving late to work, ignoring different obligations, keeping lies or secrets from family. You know, they always say the opposite or, uh, of addiction is connection, and part of connecting is not lying or keeping secrets. Uh, needing more extreme sexual activities to achieve the same level of treatment of sexual relief. Earlier when we talked about the progressive uh, addiction being a progressive disease, that highlights that. Does your sexual desire cause you to do sexual activities and involve people or places you wouldn't ordinarily choose? Um, pornography taking a great deal of your wake time. Does it cause legal problems or financial loss? Again, if it's an offensive behavior, that could be legal problems financial loss did you lose your job and or are you paying for uh various treatments uh individual couples group therapies um sexual fantasies urges consume your mentally emotionally and physically does your behavior conflict with your personal religious or moral beliefs and again those feelings of shame hopelessness and guilt related to your sexual behavior possible consequences Lack of a healthy sexual relationship with your sexual partner and your family. Notice I didn't say healthy sexual relationship. Why? Um, people can have all the sex in the world and be in a toxic relationship. Um, likewise, somebody can have no sex and have a very healthy relationship. In terms of sex addiction recovery, this is often something that the addict and the partner worry about. And what I tell them is, as you're working to building a healthier relationship, emotional intimacy and safety, um, the sexual intimacy will start returning. Issues of sexual performance, an ability to have or maintain an erection or possibly females uh, not able to lubricate uh, vaginally. Downward work performance and career loss due to inability to focus on work or watch a pornography at work. Money problems stemming from paying for sexual activities. So again, the uh, webcams, um, uh, magazines, DVDs, things of that nature. I've worked with clients who have maxed out tens of thousands of dollars on their credit cards without their spouse's knowledge. And then once it comes out during disclosure, that is a very tough pill to swallow. Health consequences include pregnancy and STIs. Um, again, once the disease continues to progress, you are being more impulsive on top of being compulsive. So um, not using things such as condom, dental dams, or other things that will protect you from STIs. Use of recreational drugs or drinking. Um, development of mental health conditions or exasperating mental health conditions. Potential jail or prison time for sexual offenses. And again, the emotional costs. How partners and families are affected. Oops, sorry. Uh, partners of sex addicts commonly experience betrayal trauma, which is an incredibly painful and isolating experience to endure in the aftermath of deliberate disloyalty. Not only has the partner's world been turned upside down, but when sex addiction is first revealed, the couples typically focus their attention to resources on the addict, uh, which causes the partner to feel sidelined, even more alone and resentful. Um, and that's often the case, even if a partner is, you know, the most supportive partner there may be, right? Um, they say, you know what, I'm trying to stay with the addict. I want them to go get the help that they need, the treatment. Well, then everybody's focused, as it says, on the addict. You know, the addict is getting support from therapy. The addict is going to support groups and having people connect with them. But what about the spouse? The spouse, everything they've known has just 
you know, been shattered. You know, the the addict may have been their rock. The addict may have been their safety. So now that that safety has been destroyed, what do they do now? How do they live with themselves? Who's going to support them? Um, the consistent lack of trust and safety felt within the relationship, in, addi in addition to the continued betrayals, results in complex trauma, which can bleed into every area of the couple's life and relationships. It becomes a lens through which partners see, think, and feel about themselves, the world, and themselves in relation to the world. So, you know, most wives or spouses of sex addicts, you know, their trust is completely broken. What do they do now, right? Every time the phone rings, they're wondering, is that uh, an affair partner? Every time they see their phone light up with a notification, you know what I mean? Is somebody reaching back out to them? If a uh, partner, you know, if the addict is going to the store and they're gone five, 10 minutes longer than the, what they should have been, do they call somebody? Do they go have a quickie? Things like that. They can't trust anything anymore. They can't trust their own feelings, you know, especially if they didn't know and they that the addict was acting out beforehand. They're like, well, they hit it so well before. Who's to say they're not hiding it now? Betrayal trauma affects the very core of attachment in relationships, trust. Betrayal trauma triggers are complex and incredibly tender, as I was just saying. Working with a certified partner trauma therapist uh, who is willing to hold space for them and understands that their recovery is theirs alone to anyone else's. So the CPTT understands that the partner has their own recovery journey apart from the addict, and they will give them that space to process and work on what they need to work on. Um, as I said earlier, you know, I was talking about disclosure, the addict has their therapist, which is a CSAT. The partner has a therapist, which is hopefully a certified partner trauma therapist or somebody sensitive to partners in relation to sex addiction. And then the couple comes together. So that's the three-legged stool, which I believe I'm going to get into in a minute anyways, in a couple of minutes. Sex and love addiction both have a profound impact on the loved ones of the addicted individual, often resulting in family members with low self-esteem, high levels of stress and anxiety, trust issues, fear, and anger. Harm costs to both the addicted person and families include financial problems. We kind of discussed that before with, uh, you know, money on the prostitutes, pornography, show clubs, and treatment in general. Um, legal problems if they're having offending behaviors, solicitation, child pornography, voyeurism, etc., an ability to maintain healthy relationships. So because they're acting out, they may end up getting divorced. Um, there may be domestic violence, and that can go both ways. Um, the addict may be violent toward the the partner, or the partner may become violent toward the addict, feeling as if the addict deserves to be hurt, you know, because of the emotional pain they've caused the partner, and or substance abuse, cross-addiction. Mood changes. The addicted person may experience intense mood swings um, with any addiction. Again, we talked about earlier the possible escape of feelings or numbing of feelings, right? A lot of the times um, an addict will act out because they don't know how to process what's happening. So now that the addiction and the numbing uh, feeling is gone, well, now they're having these intense, uh, intense anxious episodes. Uh, they may be fearful and they don't know how to process that or how to experience feelings normally. Part of the, the therapy is to train them and to teach them how to manage their mood and express their feelings appropriately. But initially, they can have intense mood swings because of it. Risky sexual behavior, unsafe sex may cause transmission of STDs or STIs uh, to romantic partners. Whether sex addiction is in fact genetic is still up for debate. However, research certainly suggests that there is a correlation that plays some role related to emotional dysregulation, instant gratification, anxiety, and depression. Children of addicted parents experience long-term consequences of low self like low self-esteem, anxiety, fear of abandonment, helplessness, and chronic depression. When children don't witness healthy adult relationships, they're likely to recognize their form healthy relationships as adults, thus continuing the cycle. I've worked with, again, many people who have said, you know, um, I'll use this person in particular, their uh, father was a sex addict. Their uncles are sex addicts. So all they saw growing up was how a male sex addict interacted with uh, their partners. 
that was normalized for them. Um, seeing that, and even though it was normalized, they didn't want to engage in the behavior themselves. So they made a commitment to never, you know, once in a committed relationship or marriage to do it, them, uh, to act out or to cheat or to uh, have acting out sexual behaviors. However, they find themselves repeating the same thing, falling into the same patterns when they don't get the help or support that they need. And this person, you know, um, it, this is the same actual person that I was talking about earlier in terms of the uh, autopilot. So they didn't know um, how to express themselves until one day everything just kind of hit down the rock bottom and then they found themselves talking to me. Treatment options. Sexual addiction is treated with a combination of psychotherapy, individual, couples, family group, psychoeducation groups, and self-help group therapy. Three-leg stool, that's what I was saying earlier about the, uh, the addict needing therapy, the partner needing therapy, and then the doing couples. If you have a three-legged stool and you remove one of those legs, you're gonna the they're topple over, right? That's the the premise behind it. Um, two legs will not be able to stand alone if it's meant to be a three-leg stool. So without all three of those therapy aspects, um, it's hard that the relationship will survive or that the uh, both couple the couple itself will have a healthy recovery. Uh, why some people say four leg stool, the fourth leg will be uh, group therapy. And again, even though you're adding that leg, you may say, well, then if you take away the fourth leg and there's still other three legs, you just stand up, right? Well, no, because if it's supposed to be four legs, it's not going to be fo formed like a triangle. It'll be something like this. And when one leg falls, it's going to teeter eventually once there's some pressure. Certified sex addiction therapist. That's what I'm a candidate for. That's uh, it's a highly trained trauma treatment specialist to help clients work through issues that untrained clinicians may leave unaddressed because CSATs understand the underlying wounds, experiences, patterns, and trauma that can lead to sex, sexual addiction. It is an intense uh, 20 days worth of training, which is broken down into four modules. Um, certified partner trauma therapist for betrayal trauma. We talked about that earlier. The focus is on the partner, not the addict. Um, working with the CPTT guarantees the partner will be tr not treated as the problem. Um, the CPTTs understand that partners deserve their own specialized therapy apart from the addict's recovery efforts. They know partners are not crazy for choosing the addict or for staying with people expecting uh, them to leave. I have an example of another person I've worked with. Um, their spouse uh, wanted to see a therapist. But um, they saw a therapist out of convenience. So I don't know if you guys know the website. You probably do the uh, psychologytoday.com. Um, and this particular spouse looked up psychologytoday.com um, and found a therapist who was close by to their work. But what they didn't do was look for a CPTT. So when the spouse went and saw this therapist uh, and the spare therapist did not have that specialized training, um, they just tried to convince the spouse to leave the addict. The spouse was saying, I don't want to leave the addict. I'm trying to figure out my feelings around this and how I can possibly stay. And they're just telling them to leave right away. So, you know, if they would have gone to see CPTT, yes, that they wouldn't have steered the partner to stay with the addict or to leave the addict, but instead would have focused on the partner's recovery and what they need to do uh, in the moment to then decide, you know, once they have everything at their disposal and they are in a better place emotionally, psychologically, are they staying or are they going? Uh, some other treatment options and techniques. Uh, these are just a few of many different uh, orientations, perspectives, conceptualize and treat sex addiction. Uh, cognitive behavior therapy, CBT, focuses on replacing negative thoughts and behaviors with other ways to better cope and reduce the impulse to have sex. It aims to change negative, triggering thoughts into positive ones with self-talk and offer affirmations. Uh, by engaging in self-talk, they learn to identify the triggers, understand their thoughts and feelings, accept themselves, their shortcomings through the, out the process. Acceptance and commitment therapy uses acceptance and mindfulness strategies. Its goal is for individuals to accept the stress and to change the relationship with their thoughts rather than change the thoughts themselves. So instead of saying, I'm a terrible person for having a thought, the focus is getting the addict to accept the distress that's happening 
and and, so, and to change that distress into something more positive. Sex positive sexual integration. Unfortunately, sexual compulsivity can lead to a lot of shame around sex, but shame about sex isn't only the isn't the only consequence of sex addiction. It's often a cause. There's a lot of recovery work that involves acceptance of who you are and what you want, identifying boundaries for clients and their relationships. That helps clients learn how to better communicate their needs. Um, sensate focus is often a part of this. Sensate focus, uh, long story short, is um, kind of slowly reintegrating, um, you know, sexual touch, um, different sexual acts, desires uh, uh, with the partners. Motivational interviewing. This guides individuals to the process of exploring the sex addiction in the context of their own personal goals and values. Psychodynamic therapy. For those who may be suffering from sex addiction due to past trauma or abuse, psychodynamic therapy is built upon the premise that repressed memories are a source that affect behavior. It aims to uncover hidden memories and conflicts from childhood and current stimuli that are fueling the addiction. Through this therapy, a patient usually gains some sort of affirmation of what they're struggling is not their fault. And there's often a lot of shame and self-loathing in sex addiction. So this approach shows the patient they aren't the ones to blame. So it's this is about awareness. And I do this a lot with my clients, right? They're not aware, you know, when they're in the autopilot mode that we talked about earlier, they're not aware of what they're doing always, some of the consequences that are happening or why they're acting the way they are. So I help the clients to identify what's going on with them, to become aware of their behaviors and what's triggering their behavior and find a way to move past that. There are no specific medications that will treat sex addiction, but it can work in conjunction with other treatment options such as therapy. Um, so the only one that I was able to find is antiadrogens, which is medications targeting male sex hormones to reduce and are useful in reducing obsessive thoughts. They can be tried in extreme cases of sexual acting out when behaviors are dangerous to others. Uh, other treatment options, I'll go more in depth, are self-help and 12-step support groups. Uh, sex Sexaholics Anonymous, SA, is different than all the other groups because it defines the problem as addiction to lust rather than addiction to sex. It's the only fellowship that specifically defines sobriety in terms of specific behavior. According to SA, any form of sex with oneself or with partners other than the spouse is progressively addictive and destructive. SA even goes further by narrowing this definition to marriage between a man and a woman. This means that anyone not in a heterosexual marriage must be celibate or completely abstain for all sexual behavior, including masturbation. Well, that would turn uh, anybody who's not heterosexual off right away, right? Or if somebody is not married. Um, so the reason why I'm sharing what SA is, and I'll go over a couple of other groups in the following slides, is because it's important to find the group that is important to that particular addict. Um, if somebody is in a committed relationship, and, uh, you know, only has sex with them and essays telling them that they are, you know, that they are not sober, then, you know, they may impact them emotionally or they may justify their acting out behaviors saying that, hey, I'm, according to SA, I'm not sober anyway, so I might as well engage in those other acts that I'm not proud of. So it's important to find the type of meeting that will best benefit you. Sex Addicts Anonymous, SAA, the goal is abstinence from one or more specific sexual behaviors, but unlike programs for recovering alcoholics or drug addicts, Sex Addicts Anonymous does not have a universal definition of abstinence. Most of us have no desire to stop being sexual altogether. It's not sex in and of itself that causes problems, but the addiction to certain sexual behaviors. And SAA, we will better be able to determine what behavior is addictive and what is healthy. However, the fellowship does not dictate to its members what is and isn't addictive sexual behavior. Instead, we have found that it is necessary for each member to define his or her own abstinence. So people who go to SAA, they decide, all right, well, maybe for them in particular, pornography is not uh, an addictive behavior. It is not a compulsion. Um, for them, though, having emotional affairs or physical affairs is. So for them, their sobriety is about making sure they're not watching porn, or excuse me, they're not having emotional or physical affairs, but pornography is okay according to them and or their spouses. Sex, love, sex and Love Addicts Anonymous, SLAA, focuses on both sex and love addiction, which is defined as any sexual emotional act, no matter its what its initial impulse may be, which leads to loss of control over rate, frequency, and duration of its occurrence or recurrence, resulting in spiritual, mental, physical, emotional, and moral destruction of oneself or others. 
SLA defines sobriety as absence from one self-identified bottom line behaviors. So both SAA and SLAA operate under the three circles. Um, the three circles are outer, uh, middle, and inner. Inner circle behaviors are the acting out behaviors. So if I'm using an example I used a moment ago for the SAA, um, if emotional and physical affairs are considered acting out, those would be considered their inner circle behaviors. Ones that they cannot do, those are considered relapses and against their sobriety. Middle circle behaviors. So pornography for them may not be considered quote unquote acting out. However, that is kind of a danger zone behavior. Um, so that's why it goes in the middle circle. So it may not be acting out per se, but what it could do is trigger different fantasies. It could trigger euphoric recall. Uh, into past acting out, which would cause them to act out again. So even though in it in of itself is not acting out, it's dangerously close to acting out and can lead to acting out behaviors, which is why it's in the middle circle. The outer circle are those behaviors that are um, positive for recovery or for use uh, for a person as an individual in general. Uh, that could be praying, meditating, playing a sport, spending time with family, etc. Sexual Compulsive Anonymous, SCA, members are encouraged to develop their own sexual recovery plan and to define sexual sobriety for themselves. We are not here to repress our God-given sexuality, but to learn how to express it in ways that will not make unreasonable demands in our time, energy, and place in legal jeopardy or endanger our mental, physical, or spiritual health. And I want to make note, the reason I, I made sure to include this is because SCA was originally existed primarily for gay and bisexual men. However, it welcomes all orientations and increasing number of men and heterosexual or women and heterosexual men attend. Um, again, trying to find the meeting which may be best for you. Um, SLAA, SAA does welcome um, uh, homosexual or those across the LGBTQ community, plus community. Sexual Recovery Anonymous, SRA, was formed by SA members who broke away from SA because of the sobriety definition. It defines sexual sobriety as the release from all compulsive and destructive sexual behaviors. We have found that through our experience that sobriety includes freedom from masturbation and sex outside a committed relationship. So SRA it also defines in terms of specific practices, but not as restrictive as SA. So this is outside. It's not just about marriage. It can include... Um, you know, any sort of committed relationship and doesn't specifically say between men or women either. These meetings are currently not in Illinois, but can be found via Zoom. Uh, I know we're almost out of time, so I'm going to try to go a little quicker. And I apologize. Again, you can ask me more questions afterwards if you like. Different agencies have other specialty groups. There's porn recovery groups that focus specifically on porn, but also discuss sex, love, and fantasy addiction as well. There's Help Her Heal groups. This agencies will run a book based on the book Help Her Heal by Carol Jurgensen Sheets with Alan Katz. And it is a workbook to help male sex addicts learn how to help their female partners heal from betrayal trauma. Out of the Dog House, it's a uh, book based on Robert Weiss's teachings, uh, strategies how to communicate, promote healing, and save marriages. Essanon and Essateen, similar to Alan and Alateen. Essanon family groups are for those who are hurting a response to the sexual addiction of someone close to them. Doesn't matter whether that person is a family member, partner, spouse, child, or someone outside, like a family, a friend, teacher, or boss. Sexaholism can affect anyone. It's for all sexual orientations, genders, denominations, and races, those in a relationship or not. Um, SNI groups meet weekly as a way for members to share their experiences. And the SA Teen Fellowship welcomes young people from 12 to 19 years of age. Um, and they are often led by a certified adult SA Teen group sponsors rather than just having a group of 12 to 19 year olds um, talk amongst themselves. There's uh, some guidance. Uh, these are just some resources on how to find meetings. Um, so smeetingchicago.com is what I preferably like to do when I'm helping my clients search for meetings. Um, I was going to show you guys, but it doesn't look like we're going to have time how to navigate that site. But if we do, I will. And there's also several podcasts if you search sex addiction recovery. Some resources. These are just some books um, that are used for early recovery. Facing the Shadow, Starting Your Sexual Relationship Journey. It's this book by Patrick Carnes. He's kind of the father of sex addiction. Um, he still runs ITAP uh, along with his daughter Stephanie Carnes and this book provides essential tools for relapse prevention and basic introductions on how to create your recovery plan 
out of the dock house, which I mentioned a few moments ago in terms of groups is a step-by-step -step relationship saving guide, uh, helps the sex addicts, but how it helps, uh, with information, how the sex addict betrayal has hurt their partner, how to communicate with their partner in ways that promote healing and what to do to help save the relationship. Robert Weiss also wrote Sex Edition 101. Uh, it's after defining and providing an overview of sex addiction, it discusses the causes of sexual addiction, addiction online or digital behaviors, addiction interaction when the addict pairs up with other addictions, uh, sex addiction, sexual orientation, and how to give your healing journey the best start possible. Just three more groups here. Your sexually addicted spouse, how partners can cope and heal by Barbara Steffens and Marsha Means. This book was written for partners to help them understand what they're going through and to instill hope. So for the partners. Treating pornography addiction, the essential tools for recovery by Kevin Skinner. Kevin Skinner is awesome. He did the first module or part of the first module training that I did. Um, it's about how recovering from pornography addiction addresses the unique contours of porn addiction and how unconscious beliefs about oneself and relationships can return a struggling person when pornography is trapped and how to kick the habit for good. And the last book I'll just mention is Breaking Addiction. It's a seven step handbook for ending any addiction by Lance Dodes. Uh, it's a way uh, helping the addict manage feelings. Each decision to use a substance or act out sexually is unconscious and automatic. That all, That's the autopilot we talked about before. And the way out of addiction, increasing awareness of the overwhelming feelings that precede the urge that screams, I have to act out right now. All right, those are my references. Thank you. Any questions? I'm sorry that I rushed the last part of the presentation. Thanks, Danny. Um, yeah, we got about three minutes. Uh, if anybody has any questions or comments, and I'll, I'll also mention that I can provide uh, those slides for anybody that needs them if they want to keep the, that resource information at the end. But yeah, I'll open it up for a couple minutes here. Well, first of all, thank you, Danny. Um, you know, this is a process addiction that's deeply enveloped in shame. And, um, you know, um, uh, I look forward to getting those slides because I know, um, well, uh, I'm a person with lived experience and um, I have uh, many years clean and sober and I'm active in my home group um, in sponsoring people. And um, I guess it shouldn't be surprising, but it is. Uh, how many guys I talk to when we're working through the steps and we got, get to step four and then step five. And uh, all of a sudden, you know, I'm hearing all kinds of stuff that sound like uh, possible sex addictions. And uh, I, so I sometimes I feel like, look, buddy, we're working on alcohol and drugs right now. I don't know if my mind can hold like, you know, all these other things that are are, are going on. And uh, so to be able to offer some of these folks uh, viable alternatives, um, you know, um, addiction's a monster and it's sort of like whack-a-mole, you know, it moves around sometimes with certain people. And uh, with the idea of the deeply uh, in ground ingrained shame with the, those activities, but also one of the things uh, is the learning process. You know, little boys and little girls learn things from their grownups and the things that they find on the internet and television, et cetera. And it's trying to find a way to teach the little ones, you know, uh, before this becomes a problem, you know, how to uh, properly interact with uh, uh, each other and to form relationships that are powerful and positive. Um, you know, and uh, um, yeah, yeah, it's uh, it's an incredible topic and uh, one that I look forward maybe someday sitting down and talking with you, but I'll stop talking right now. Sounds good. Thanks, Ben. I appreciate it. Anybody else got any questions or comments? I've, I've got a quick one if nobody else does. Uh, I just wanted to talk about real briefly how this particular topic was uh, a blind spot for me for a long time. Um, and how I kind of came across it was we had a client once who, um, a heterosexual male client, um, his uh, drug of choice was stimulants. So he was using methamphetamine, cocaine, and uh, his cross addiction was such that every time he used uh, methamphetamine was when he would want to act out sexually. Uh, and it was so deeply tied to that, um, that he did not have a sexual preference as far as gender uh, when he used. And he would tell me like, no, if I'm not using, you know, I'm very, I'm a straight guy, but um, when I'm using stimulants, I really don't care who it is. And so I just had a quick question on the people that 
you've worked with over the years, is stimulants one of those things that seems to be pretty tied into sex addiction as far as the cross addiction goes? It, it definitely is, right? It, it's it, any drug, really, but it, amongst the homosexual population, methamphetamines and stimulants are there a lot. Stimulants is also with heterosexuals, but um, it's any way to numb or to increase a, a different pleasure, right? Oh, sorry, just saw another question. It's any any way of shutting off your feelings, right? Or to increase the stimulation. I lost my train of thought. Is that really the question? I apologize. <laughs> but uh, yeah. That's okay. I think uh, Slay asked if on that criteria, is there a specific number of those that have to be yes for the criteria to be uh, determined as a sex addict? Uh, if they're like a yes, believe, no question. Right, I criteria. believe there was 11 thing or marks on there and I think it's anything above six. Thank you. No problem. Excellent. Well, I want to be cognizant of everybody's time, so I'm going to go ahead and wrap it up. Um, I will put this up on the YouTube later today, and then if anyone's interested, I can provide those slides, or Danny can provide those slides to you. And uh, yeah, that was great. Thanks, Danny. No problem. I will say one last quick thing to Salaya. Everybody else have a point. Yeah. Um, there. That's just a very quick one. There's a larger one that's like 30 questions that I can always share at a different point as well. So I just wanted to mention that. Thank you. All right. Have a great day, everybody. Thanks. Thanks. Appreciate it. Bye. Nice to see everyone.